Welcome to another webinar lead series from our webinars brought to you by Connected Women of Influence. I'm Michelle Berquist, your host today, and we are delighted yet again to bring you another informative webinar to our Association of Professional Women. Our webinars are designed for you as the professional <laughs> leader in business, whether you're an aspiring female leader, or if you're a woman who's leading people or projects or teams or even a company. We select topics and themes that support your goal to lead, achieve, and succeed more effectively in business. Few logistics, our webinars are just shy of one hour, and at the half hour mark, we'll be answering any questions that you've submitted online during the presentation portion of our webinar. I'm delighted to say that our topic and title today is how to lead like a lady with presence, power, and purpose. And I am excited to introduce our thought leader today. Let me introduce you to Katherine Mowbray Lawrence. She, I'm just gonna share a little bit of info with you, but just know that she is a lovely dynamo lady and she's from Britain, she's British. Um, here's Katherine's information. She, in order to overcome her innate shyness at age 15, Katherine enrolled in competitive speech classes at her high school and she won awards of distinction and continued competing into her college years. To date, she has presented talks and workshops on six out of the seven continents. I just wanted to really say that with impact because that's impressive. Six out of the seven contacts. Con continent. From Singapore to South Africa to San Diego, Catherine has worked with motivated professionals, enhancing communication <laughs> and igniting confidence. Today, Catherine works with ambitious, contemporary female leaders to quantum leap their success and enhance their competence in the areas of communication, professional development, and leadership. Her distinctive background and travel to 67 countries has provided her with a unique foundation to present specialized, targeted training and workshops with her executive training programs, and this is a tongue twister for me, her training programs in poised, polished, powerful presentations, tips, taboos, and troubleshooting in international business, mastering magnificence, executive presence, Whew, and her special event speaker showcase. This is significant. Her elegant persona and diplomatic approach served up with a charming British lilt and sharp wit has been warmly embraced by companies in healthcare, entrepreneurship, hospitality, and tourism. <laughs> I want to welcome and Catherine say hello to all of our attendees. That was a hello. lot. You're amazing. <laughs> Good grief. Thank you, Michelle. Yes, I I tongue, deliberately tongue tripped you up with my alliteration, which I absolutely <laughs> love alliteration. I just think it trips off oh, the tongue and awesome. helps people to remember. And the only really? continent where I haven't spoken is Antarctica. So I don't know if I Wowza. ever will do that, but that's the only one. And it's it on your bucket a bit list. Too chilly for me. Yeah. Now that I reside <laughs> in California, my blood will be too thin to go there. I think. <laughs> I love it. Uh, well, just. Can't wait to hear what you have to say. So you are on, my dear. <laughs> Thank you so much. And welcome, everyone. Happy Monday. It is indeed a pleasure to be here. And I know that there are many powerful women who will be listening and are listening to this webinar. CWI does a great job. I love the lead, achieve, and succeed that they have in the introduction to their webinars. And this webinar is designed for professional women, for those speakers, business owners, emerging and contemporary thought leaders who wish to enhance their influence, authority, confidence, and presence. And my intention for you to take away today is to raise your awareness in noticing how you show up and how you are perceived, to build on those positive traits that you already possess and your willingness to grow and develop as you step into your power, up your game, and enhance your confidence and competence. Executive presence is not a measure of your performance or your academic credentials, but a way of being, demonstrating to others that you are a confident, poised, and authentic leader. Academic degrees are admirable and certainly needed in today's competitive marketplace, but would that be sufficient to achieve a coveted promotion, a new job, impress decision makers enough to make you a fabulous job offer, 
or to secure that big new client. Whether you're auditioning for the lead violin position in a symphony, presenting to 300 managers in your company, <clears throat> excuse me, or courting potential angel investors, how you show up is absolutely vital to how well you will be received. It's not always easy to verbalize the traits of executive presence, but you certainly recognize it when you see it. In a University of London study, psychologist and researcher Chia Jong Se learned that people focus more on stage presence than on performance. Let me tell you a little bit about that study. Using a sample of an audience of 1,200 people made up of novices and experts, half the audience was watching a silent video of singers performing in an international competition, and they were asked to pick the winners. The other half of the audience watched the video with the audio. With the audio, novices and experts picked the winners 33% of the time. With the silent video alone, the success rate was higher with a 46 to 53% of the audience choosing the winner. So what does that mean? This study underscores the tremendous power of image, how one communicates passion through body language and facial expressions forms an indelible impression of you in others. Your ability to connect, engage, influence, and communicate meaningfully with others while projecting a poised, polished, professional self-image, there's that alliteration again, is a key factor in determining your professional success. And men and women who receive the loyalty, respect, approval from their team and clients convey to others that they are an influencer and an authority and in charge. And while executive presence is not a measure of your performance as mentioned before, it certainly is about mastering those noticeable yet intangible qualities of executive presence, some of which we will cover today in this webinar. This quote is by Margaret Thatcher. And I absolutely admired her tremendously. She was also called the Iron Lady. She was first Prime Minister of England from 1979 to 1990, and she won three elections and served longer than any other British Prime Minister in 150 years. When she started to become a notable figure in conservative British politics, she agreed to an image makeover. This included her hair color and style, as well as power dressing. So she was on the light um, brown blonde side, but she certainly did not want to show up as Marilyn Monroe. So they adjusted her color. They gave her a style that was soft and flattering. Out went the fussy blouses with bows and the garden party style hats that she was wont to wear. She was switched over to suits in bolder colors and styles and suits were generally agreed to photograph well, and she was said to have attractive legs. One scene in the film Iron Lady about M Margaret Thatcher, played admirably by Meryl Streep, quoted Mrs. Thatcher as saying, I may be persuaded to surrender the hat. The pearls, however, are non-negotiable. Elocution lessons rendered her overly exaggerated upper class accent that she had acquired as a young woman at Oxford into a more ordinary, identifiable speech. They wanted her to show up as one of the people. She was actually the daughter of a grocer, so she was what was considered in England at the time to be lower middle class. At Oxford, she uh, adopted her speech to be a little bit more highbrow, and they brought her back down once she started to make um, an appearance in the, in the politics. She hired a voice coach who taught her to breathe correctly and speak more slowly. And Sir Laurence Olivier taught her the importance of projecting her own authentic personality in a speech rather than echoing someone else's words and style. The pitch of her voice changed 
from what was described as strident to low, powerful, and authoritarian. <clears throat> she referred to herself not as a consensus politician, but a conviction politician. I think we could use a little bit more of Margaret Thatcher in today's politics in this country. However, moving on, in 2013, the then Prime Minister Cameron paid tribute to Margaret Thatcher as a remarkable leader who defined and overcame the challenges of the age. He went in to say that people failed to appreciate the thickness of the glass ceiling that she broke through. Uh, it's one, I wonder how often Theresa May, the current Prime Minister, channels the Iron Lady. The top three desired leadership traits. This was a 2013 survey of chief information officers conducted by the research firm Gartner, and the results overwhelmingly supported the need to establish an executive presence. So look at the slide, business acumen and knowledge, that goes without saying. An executive would not be hired if they did not have the knowledge of the job for sure. But then communication influence and professional demeanor certainly fall into the category of executive presence. And this study overwhelmingly supported the need to, to establish an executive presence in leaders. And so when asked to name the top three leadership traits for chief information officers, the respondents answered that these three traits above were more critical than a number of other important characteristics, including the following. Innovation ranked seventh. Organizational skills ranked ninth. Technology skills was a surprising 12th, which is interesting for chief information officers, and cost management 15th. It's important that you're the kind of person that can take criticism well. If you're the kind of person that needs a pat on the head and a lot of praise to excel in your job or business, you may be overly sensitive to criticism. People who keep coming back for more feedback, seek opportunities to learn, who stay calm and measured under stress, are noticed and are given more projects and responsibility. It's super important, ladies, not to fall apart when receiving constructive feedback. If you tend towards emotional responses, work on that and do all possible not to tear up when you're receiving feedback. Men hate that as well. I think, Michelle, you mentioned that in your book as, as one of the, the faults that men really criticize in ladies. Absolutely. <laughs> Avoid being defensive when you're receiving feedback and listen closely. Clarify any specifics that, that support your improvement definitively and point you on an upward trajectory. As a leader, it's important that you not only introduce but manage difficult conversations. Initiating conversations about another's appearance or about how a person speaks can be somewhat dicey, even if someone's speech patterns, incorrect grammar in speaking or writing could potentially affect business outcomes, image, or branding. Giving feedback on presentation techniques and tactics for support and improvement is not as difficult, but addressing fashion faux pas and diction goes to ethnic, cultural, or socioeconomic differences. <clears throat> Diplomacy and tact is key. Mention that what they do well and then ease into areas or opportunities for improvement. Be cautious about giving feedback that is contradictory, vague, or paradoxical. There's a professional type rope that women leaders have to assess as they balance between feminine and authoritative behavior. With executive presence, you are judged on what you wear, your hair, your makeup, your nails, your shoes. Are they too high? Are they not stylish? Are they frumpy? how you walk, 
your posture, your body language and gestures, your presentation skills, both public speaking and how you physically present yourself, your manners, polish, etiquette, and all of that will determine how well or not you are received by staff, clients, or any audience. Your appearance is your personal brand and image. It should be consistent. Whether you are a frontline employee looking for a promotion, the boss, or a busy solopreneur, you will be noticed and judged by how you look. Just start with the basics. Honestly assess and rate your appearance. Consider if your clothing is appropriate for your position, the job you want, and the company culture. Is it time to update your style, haircut, and color, as well as your makeup? Or is it still reflecting how you looked in the 70s or 80s with big hair would be the 80s? I actually like that look, but that's just an aside. <laughs> I'm with you on that one. I kind of <laughs> like the big look as well. <laughs> and I think we all like what we Texas, like. The women in Texas, I think, still like the big hair. Could be wrong. Careful. <laughs> <clears throat> One of the biggest head headaches in the workplace, according to HR managers, is women who show up dressed as if they were going out to a club, wobbling into a meeting on stilettos and wearing a low cut blouse certainly does not inspire confidence in your abilities or reflect your competence. Yet that is how you will be judged. Chewing gum or having gum visible in your mouth is certainly not classy, and you should avoid this behavior to project a positive image. Even if you work in a company where the dress code is casual, appearing pulled together at work is important. If after realistically assessing your appearance, you find some opportunity to improve, what will you commit to changing within the next two weeks? Notice what you say and how you say it. <clears throat> Leadership is certainly not about being this popular. Having the courage to handle those tough, potentially confrontational conversations will garner the trust and respect that is so crucial to effective leadership. Provide actionable, timely, constructive feedback to your direct reports and teams and give a compliment that speaks to the credibility or progress of the individual and tie it in with a reassuring suggestion for improvement. Here's an example of how it should be done. Susan, your knowledge of the overall project is impressive and valuable. However, when you present, you tend to speak very quickly and this doesn't allow people to assimilate your concepts and ideas. It projects nerves and lack of confidence. If you could simply practice slowing down the pace of your speech and your presentations, that would make a huge difference in how you and your message would be perceived and received. Your voice is your instrument and your calling card. It definitely should be heard and understood. Work on any mispronunciations that you may use in daily life and ask friends or colleagues for feedback if you aren't sure. Lower tones are preferable for women's voices. And please note that a louder volume does not necessarily equate to authority. If there's an opportunity in a room of, say, a few dozen people or 50 or 75 people, use the microphone. It will stop the strain on your voice and provide a lower volume, which will be more pleasant to the ears of those listening and watching you. As a woman with executive presence, your voice should convey qualities of sincerity, strength, passion, conviction, cheerfulness, confidence, and be pleasing to the ear. You will always wish to avoid sounding little girlish, hesitant, shrill, preachy, whiny, and use a pause when you speak. The pause is the most underused form of speech. Use it to make a point regain your footing, and heighten the power of your statement. <clears throat> For those of you who may be old enough who are listening to us today, 
Do you remember the film Working Girl from the 1980s, which starred Melanie Griffith and Sigourney Weaver? Do you remember how Melanie Griffith's character reworked her image? She cut back on her makeup. She took a lot of her jewelry off that she felt jangled and didn't work with the job that she wished to have. She worked on copying Sigourney Weaver's dulcet tones. And she also adjusted her hairstyle and, of course, her appearance. She completely reworked her image to achieve what she wanted for the job that she wished to have. And she got Harrison Ford. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Do record your voice and practice often, ladies, if you wish to shed the tentative and dive into the powerful. Speaking with an uptick at the end of your sentence as if you were asking a question is certainly one of my uh, suggestions to improving if you do uh, speak that way. It used to just be a habit of a younger woman, but it certainly does not as uh, inspire a strong leadership presence. It suggests a hesitant approach. Using ums, ahs, you knows, and likes in your speech is a bad pattern that you will want to work on to correct. Unfortunately, in the workplace, poor communication can be construed as poor performance, which is always contrary to how you wish to show up and be perceived. If this is an area on which you wish to improve, investigate options such as Toastmasters or workshops that provide a safe, supportive environment to learn. And if nerves and anxiety are an issue for you, make it a priority to learn how to manage this. Public speaking is one of those skills that must be practiced in order to improve. You can only progress so far by watching. You have to actually speak in public. <clears throat> it would be like learning to swim by reading and watching others without ever getting into the pool. You will certainly improve by doing, observing those whom you admire, and incorporating new skills one at a time. Do you recognize this lady, the Miranda Priestley leadership style? I had to introduce this in this webinar today. Miranda Priestley, played by Oscar winner Meryl Streep, was one of the primary characters in this fun 2006 film, The Devil Wears Prada. As the editor-in-chief of Runway Magazine, Miranda caused emotional and psychological distress among her staff. She consistently intimidated her team, worked them almost to death, never said thank you, never expressed understanding of personal commitments or communicated with them respectfully. However, Miranda always looked great. Appearance was everything to her. If you remember the film, you will notice and remember that she never raised her voice. She would blast someone as she would look in this slide, and then she would say, that's all. Intimidation was her management tool of choice. Even if there's no Miranda Priestley in your professional life at present, there are situations with clients and managers whose fear and threats are their default styles. This behavior can create a toxic environment with incredible stress. But you sometimes need to see a contrast in either behavior that you do or do not wish to emulate to get clear on developing your own positive traits. You are the compass for your own behavior and leadership style. Follow your inner guidance to be in alignment with your values. This speaks to your authenticity. Men often don't see the double standard, even if they are applying it to their own work situation. <clears throat> Sylvia Hewlett, in her book, Executive Presence, mentions that in one survey about executive presence, 31% of the respondents indicated that being too passive actually undercuts a woman's executive presence, while the other 31% responded that being too bossy undermines a woman's executive presence. So figure that one out, I certainly can't. Traditional roles have been the taking charge behavior expected in male leaders and the taking care qualities the requisite for women. 
many senior executive women are working on cultivating both. And female leaders may be vilified for speaking out forcefully. Men may complain about their women subordinates in meetings if they were embarrassed either by the woman appearing tentative, unsure of their facts, or being too deferential in their behavior, or not being a team player. Alternatively, if you show up in command, beautifully groomed, you may be accused of being out of touch with your team. Executive presence for women leaders can certainly be a double-edged sword. A person with gravitas possesses dignity, power, influence, authority, presence, and solemnity of manner. It's a somewhat elusive yet desirable quality of leadership. If you guessed it has something to do with gravity, you're exactly right. It's, there's a weightiness there in how a person shows up. Books about executive presence all mention gravitas as a key factor, and this trait is the cornerstone of executive presence. Ancient Roman citizens looked for this quality in their leadership and considered it to be a virtue. From the book Gravitas, Communicate with Confidence, Influence, and Authority by Caroline Goida, the gravitas equation is defined as where knowledge, purpose, and passion meet. So increase your self-awareness and work on your developing your gravitas. Let your anxiety, self-doubt, and insecurity go, and don't worry about how you measure up. Learn to define where your inner balance is and seek to cultivate that. Know where your trigger points are for stress, anger, upset, and know where you need to adjust and manage those emotions within yourself. This takes emotional intelligence. Handling a catastrophe with purpose and calm can create gravitas. On January 15, 2009, U.S. Air Captain Sully Sullenberger landed his Airbus on New York's freezing Hudson River following a bird strike and loss of power in both engines. He landed the plane and all passengers and crew were safe. His calm leadership in the face of such unprecedented crisis won this quiet man an unwanted place in the spotlight. The opposite of gravitas would be frazzled, indecisive, distracted, vague, and wimpy. Certainly not traits that Sully Sullenberger presented. If you don't pay attention to your body language on a daily basis, and I would imagine that you don't, to enhance executive presence, I suggest that you do so and learn to develop a powerful physical way to show up. The way you carry yourself demonstrates your personal power or lack thereof. Are you concerned about the impression that you make? Are you feeling insecure? powerless, tentative, well, that will reflect in your body language by your folding in on yourself. Angela Merkel is five foot five inches, but she carries herself like a confident leader. In a meeting, men spread themselves out, ankle over knee, arms extended. They take up space, man spreading. This releases pheromones and testosterone. Ladies wish to appear powerful, Take up more room at the board table. Lean forward and on the edge of your chair. <clears throat> your chin should be even with the floor, your shoulders back. Stride confidently and smoothly to your place at the board table. But this is hard to do in stilettos. Amy Cuddy's research in her best-selling book, Presence, shows that when you expand your body, you will correspondingly feel powerful. Cortisol is lowered, and there are marked increases in testosterone. And the opposite is true when you're using your weak poses. So what is a power pose? The triumphant fist pump, which even athletes blind from birth use the triumphant fist pump. The Wonder Woman pose with your legs a little bit apart and your hands on your hips. And the starfish that I'm doing in this slide between these two bronze horse sculptures. Those are very powerful poses. Amy Cuddy says, if you hold these poses for two minutes, you will start to feel the positive change in your mind and in your brain. Anytime you use weak, limiting, constricted poses, 
you will not show up with influence and authority. So notice what triggers your weaker poses and work to overcome that. Use the power poses when facing a challenge, an important meeting, ending a professional or personal relationship, giving notice, and any situation where you need to boost your confidence. Don't worry about what you are not. Think about or list your strengths. The following strategies may help you to stay on track. Pay attention and focus on where you wish to be and what you are becoming. Be understanding and patient with yourself. Adopt one new quality or trait at a time and master that before moving on. Ground yourself in who you are, the value that you bring, and how you serve others, as well as how you give back. Be aware of the executive present traits in others and emulate those qualities you wish to enhance Discard mannerisms and characteristics that detract from you and work on incorporating executive presence into your daily professional life so that they will enable you to power up your success and thrive. Wow. There we go. We all want to thrive, I think. Catherine, that was awesome. I mean, I think we've got a ton of questions coming in, so that's great. Um, I want to thank you because I learned, was that actually a picture of you between those two horses? I never recognized that before. Where was that? Yes, it was. It was in oh my uh, gosh. Rego Spring. There are huge life-size uh, sculptures out there. For those of you who may not know or be listening out of Southern California, Borrego Springs is out in the desert east of San Diego. And they have Tyrannosaurus Rex. They have birds. And um, I'm so concerned about copyright issues that I try to use my own photographs wherever I can. Oh my gosh. I, I, that was, I was like, wow, I had no idea. But, you know, the, <clears throat> the questions are coming in. And I, you know, I got to say, just from my standpoint, I think there's times from an executive presence, maybe not gravitas, but from an executive presence standpoint, I feel like I'm totally, let's call it in the zone and I'm on it. And other times, you know, I just, I don't know, I guess I feel like I don't feel like my executive presence is coming through right. And here are some of the questions. You know, one person said, um, how, do I, how do I better improve my executive presence in how to handle tough conversations? I'm not sure if you have any tips on that for that question, but what would be maybe your suggestions and advice? Well, I touched on that slightly in the slides. Uh, again, you want to come from always wanting to serve, suggest improvements, and compliment them where they're doing something right. So I think in the example I talked about the woman that, that the leader was um, coaching who spoke too quickly. And this sometimes is a trait of younger women, quite frankly, and also people who are on the Eastern seaboard. They speak much more quickly than we do on the West Coast. And of course, the South is even slower than we are. So I know that sometimes if I'm listening to a webinar by someone who's from the Northeast, I really struggle to keep up and I can't always absorb their concepts and I don't have time to process. So if you want to come from serving and, and assisting and improving them and really working on where they're coming from, you don't want to make them feel bad. You just want to encourage them, talk about what they do right and offer just suggestions that will tweak how they can show up more powerfully. And I tell you, the result will be that you will also show up more powerfully as a leader because you'll garner their respect and their loyalty. Oh, well, that's good. You know, I mean, here's kind of a little segue on this, but this is some another comment and a question. I'm, um, I'm not great at accepting criticism. What are some tips to give <laughs> on how I can be better about receiving feedback? Well, I think you have to consider the source. And sometimes people may not present that's it. That's good advice. Especially yeah. that, let's just talk, talk about you personally. That's what you're doing, right? Talking about you personally in this instance. Or is you know, this is what I've got. I, I would assume, let's just say it's from a work environment. I'm not sure, you know, anything okay. more than that. Okay. Well, you have to consider the source and really investigate. Is there a nugget in there that you could take on as a potential for improvement? 
if it's, if it's from your boss who's always been jealous of the way you are received because perhaps she isn't as well received or your male boss isn't, you know, doesn't give communication well, then I think you need to consider if there's a nugget in there, if there's something and just be with it, be with the feedback and certainly don't be jumped to defensiveness right away. You can always say, I'm not sure that I see that just yet, but let me think about that. And I appreciate your feedback. Let me think about that and circle back with you in a couple of days. And, um, and so that's what I've done before, because sometimes I was given feedback that I felt was unfair and untrue, especially in a corporate environment where you're getting 360. So sometimes people giving me my boss feedback right. was from people that reported to me and perhaps I caught them online shopping quite a few times and they were not happy that I caught them online shopping at work. So they chose to be, um, you know, just try to affect my reputation by saying how bossy I was and how controlling I was and how manipulative I was. So I took that and thought, well, how can I adjust my approach? And, and then I started sometimes just walking past their desk and not saying anything. And like, you uh. know, like, do you remember the, the, you remember the cartoon of Snoopy where he would look like a vulture on top of his little kennel? That's kind of what I projected <laughs> into my mind. It's like, we are all on deadlines here. Why are you shopping for shoes? You right. know, so without saying anything. So I hope that helps as well. I don't think that's not an easy answer, right? Because we all have minefields in the right. workplace that, you know, come across. Exactly. I, you know, I, I'd love to share on that one just because I can't tell you, you know, just as someone who runs events and, you know, I'm, I'm part of an association that is, is just mm -hmm. amazing. And, you know, just the feedback that you get <laughs> on different things, it's like at times they blow my mind and other times I'm like, really? You know, and it, it, it is really about the response, but you know, it's not right. It's not wrong. It's just what it is. And I think what I heard from you and what in your presentation was it, it's how we handle it. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. the trick exactly. is, especially if you're someone like me who wears her feelings on her sleeves, like I do, it's very hard not to give a reaction that might be, you know, when you hear something, you're like, really, that's what you want me to change? It's hard not to react. I don't know if you have any suggestions for those of us <laughs> that wear our feelings on our sleeves, but how, maybe, is there a way to just not be reactive when somebody is kind of getting in there and giving you some of that feedback or, you know, those tough conversations? Any other thoughts on how to, you know, kind of dissuade our, our normal emotional reaction as women? Well, I think that, you know, let's just take you, you and you doing your events, for example. I know how much effort, time, thought, and organization you and your team put into an event. So sometimes people have their own ideas of what could be better, and there may be some value in that for sure. But if it's something that you just notice that makes you a little bit prickly, like you know, that would just be impossible to do. I would have to charge, you know, a ton more money if that's what they wanted. Um, I just would say, gosh, thank you so much for your feedback. I'll definitely consider that the next time. That's just what mm -hmm. I say. Um, because it doesn't make them right or wrong. And you you may want to think about it, but you, you may just dismiss it right out of hand saying that's never going to work. And it might not work. But you just don't want to make the person feel less than for offering their opinion and suggestion. So I would, again, just take the tactful route. And gosh, thank you so much for that feedback with no sarcasm. I'll consider that. Yeah, yeah. I think that's great. Um, here's another question. So can you um, read, can you, okay, hold on. I'm trying to read this right. <clears throat> can you share the books you referenced? Okay, certainly. And there's more than what I reference. They, um, one of them is Executive Presence by Sylvia Ann Hewlett. Hewlett is spelled H-E-W-L-E-T-T, -E -T, Sylvia Ann Hewlett. Gravitas is by Carolyn Goida. I've also referenced and used my material uh, from Leadership 101 by John Maxwell, How the World Sees You by Sally Hogshead. And there's another really good one in here is, um, Let's see, Daring Greatly by Brene Brown. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. Uh, let's see. The Essentials of Business Etiquette, How to Greet, Eat, and Tweet Your Way to Success by Barbara Pachter, P-A-C-H-T-E-R, Pachter. Of course, Presence by Amy Cuddy was referenced as well. Awesome. And I also yeah, I mean, referenced I, your book, Michelle Berkowitz. <laughs> 
Oh, please, please reference my book. Mine's the man book. That's what I call my book. But, you know, thank you for that. And I, I wanted to point out to any of our attendees, if you're looking, you know, for any sort of um, more information, I know your um, contact information is on um, one of the slides, Catherine, but how would you like people to reach out and contact you if they want to get in touch? Email? Um, I don't Email want to scroll back because well. they're on this webinar, but how do you want people to get in hold of you? Well, my name is Catherine Lawrence. Uh, the website is Catherine, it's spelled with a C, Lawrence, L-O-R-E-N-Z dot com. Um, email is Catherine at CatherineLawrence.com. You're welcome to reach out to me if you need a quick, uh, you know, help with this sticky situation. I'll help you to navigate those potential minefields. Happy to do so. Love it. Um, here's an interesting one, and I know you'll love this question. I work with a woman who continually puts a question after all of her statements. How can I help her curb this? <laughs> well, first of all, I, you it know, it's like the up speak, right? Yeah, it's the yeah. up speak. So, and it used to just be in the San Fernando Valley in the in the 70s, I think, and somehow it's gravitated towards our speech patterns today. And I even see mature women that are in their mid 40s speaking like that, and that just drives me crazy. So it would really depend on whether the woman, um, is she a colleague, is she a peer, or does she report to you? And that would depend on how you approach it with her. So if she's a peer and you have a really good relationship with her, you might want to perhaps just refer to it, just say, you know, if, if you see her making a presentation, or if you can give us some feedback, perhaps that you've heard from other people, and um, suggest that she not do that unless she's asking a question. It's a hard habit to break, just like using the filler words like um, uh, er, and it, you just need to mention it. If she reports to you, certainly you can give her feedback because you have the really the obligation as a leader. I say it's an obligation to mentor and coach people that work with you. I don't like coaching people who don't ask for it, especially if they're a peer or a colleague. Right. So I don't but, you know, know. Um, maybe a better way to answer that question, you know, because, again, that one's a tough one, depending on your role and your position. But what would be maybe some tips if you yourself have identified that you do what I call up speak, right, which is you put that question at the end. I mean, it definitely diminishes our influence and, um, you know, how we can get results. Authority. What would be some, right. yeah, what, what would be some suggestions if we ourselves identify we do that, what would be some tips to stop that? Because I, I actually worked with somebody that did it and it drove me crazy, but I wasn't in a position to say, hey, stop that. But, you know, it definitely diminished her, her influence. What would be maybe some tips to, you know, try to start so curbing if you, that? If, if you notice it in yourself or your um, mentoring or leading someone who does that, then I would first of all raise an awareness of it. So you, you, if you are aware of it, and then listen to other people, listen to news anchors, listen to interviews, like even Ellen DeGeneres and some of the television shows that you may like, listen to how they're interviewing the guests on their show. They don't use that up speak or uptick at the end of their sentences. And, um, and just, and record yourself. Really make a, make a plan to do something every day. Record yourself either on video or just with audio and practice. I may, mentioned that Melanie Griffith, uh, working girl from the 80s, and she practiced and she recorded and she played back how she would sound with a deeper, um, you know, more dulcet tones in her voice. So I would just raise awareness, practice on changing it, because it doesn't show that you appear tentative and hesitant. It's not how you want to show up powerfully. Right. No, I think it's good. It's hard. You know, once you start getting that, you know, I used to work with somebody and they would do that and I caught myself starting to do it, <laughs> you know, because again, you're, you, when you are close and work with people, you kind of pick up their natural tendencies. And it was something that it took, I had to try to, you know, stop doing that because I picked it up. You know, and there were, it was funny sometimes and it worked in conversation, but boy, if you're trying to, you know, persuade or make an impact, it, it was a bad habit for, for me to pick up. So good advice. Um, here's another one. And I, this is interesting. I'd, I'd really love your feedback on this is how do I determine my executive presence? I don't know if that means how I rate myself or, you know, where, where does somebody start is how I'm inferring that, you know, to determine whether 
they have it, they don't have it, they kind of have it, where would you kind of ask somebody to self-assess there and what would that be? Well, I would start by, you know, I raised some awareness today by giving you some traits of executive presence. So start to look mm -hmm. for people that you think that have executive presence and they could be male or female and see what it is about them that you like. So, for example, I always thought Nelson Mandela had tremendous executive presence, and he was in prison for, what, 27 or 28 years, but he showed up powerfully. He showed up as a leader. He stood erect and with good posture. So you can honestly assess different aspects of your, your speech, your posture, your gestures, how you move, how you walk, how you, you appear in a presentation. And um, there's also a list of executive presence traits that I have that I can certainly send anyone who is interested. And so one of the instructions on this download is to identify traits that you already think that you have but you would like to improve and circle traits that you don't feel that you have and you would like to adopt. And so that's a good place to start. So again, if you want to email me at Catherine at CatherineLawrence.com, I can point you in the right direction for that download or email it to you. Oh, man, I hope everybody takes advantage of that. So, yeah, that's great just to have what the traits are. You know, it's interesting, and I guess as a sub uh, question to that, can you, are there any, like, more powerful and influential women that you think you could share, Catherine, that have, like, great executive presence? I know Margaret Thatcher is one. Who are some other women, and maybe besides politicians? Because that's who I think of, <laughs> Hillary Clinton, Condoleezza Rice. You know, I mean, you think of just those, I mean, of course, you know, um, oh, gosh, what was her, what was the woman's name that was our Secretary of State that uh, had said there's a, there's a special place in hell for women that don't support one another. Oh, so she was the Secretary Al of, Albright? That's it, Madeline Albright. She couldn't come to Albright. mind, but. Albright, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Are there other women that, you know, you can share that maybe are powerful women and influential women that have just that great gravitas or executive presence for our and of audience? course, my mind goes blank. I like Sheryl, Sheryl Sandberg. Mm -hmm. um, she is excellent. Uh, who else? Um, the founder of Spanx. I'm trying to think who she is. I can't remember her name. I just saw yep. her recently, too. Do you know who I mean? I can picture her, I can't think of her name. I mean, that, that's what, what's sad is, I got to say, I mean, my mind goes to Oprah Winfrey, Oprah, you know, Ellen DeGeneres in a different way because yeah. they're TV and media personalities. But th the sad part is I think aren't there very few women, you know, that are that big and powerful? Because, I mean, you can think of, I could probably list 10, 15 different men, but women are very few, which is sad, right? Well, I think there are women within Connected Women of Influence who have executive presence. I think they show up powerfully. They're respected. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think uh, I, I have worked with women who both, you know, who, under, who tried to undermine me uh, and make me look foolish. And those that were great leaders and supportive and had respect from the men and the women who were in their um in their departments or direct reports. And I can think of some at UC San Diego Health System. And I, you know, I, I can, I, but I look for it. And again, it's a raising an awareness. And so think, okay, this woman is speaking now. How, how does she show up? How, and sometimes it's just a really powerful presence. And even, like I mentioned, Sully Sullenberger, very quiet, low key sort of man, but right. he certainly was catapulted into the international spotlight. And, you know, he had this incredible leadership ability and calm under grace under fire is another quality that uh, C-suite executives are looking for in their team. And he had all of that. He had them. And then, in, and, and then again, he's very quiet and doesn't like the spotlight. Right. And yeah, very. Un well, I, I think it always starts man. with, and maybe, maybe I was asking the wrong question, not because when you think of somebody who is a public figure or well-known, it's like there are some phenomenal leaders that are quiet, that get the job done, that have presence. And, you know, I mean, all those characteristics, I don't think there's one definition. So I probably asked about, you know, the wrong question. You know, when, um, another person asked, what are some weak poses? You mentioned what the you know, kind of um, strong poses okay. or empower poses, what, what, what causes, what would be viewed as a weak pose? Well, anything that you draw, where you draw into yourself. So 
I would say if you're sitting at a chair, for example, and you're folding your arms and your legs are wrapped around each other so they're not only crossed, but your, you know, the toes of one foot is tucked against the calf of the other foot. So anything where you're, you're folded in on yourself, um, anything that doesn't take up space. So, uh, for example, um, if you're leaning on a table and you're presenting and you lean forward, anytime you're taking up space, you are presenting with a, with a powerful pose. But anything that makes you draw in is, is a weak pose. And then that leads to, I don't think, you know, a couple of <laughs> listeners put, what is man, did you say, I call it, well, you said man spreading. You might want to yeah. share a little more about what is man spreading, because that's exactly what you're talking about here for a little bit, right? As far as what women In, versus men do. Men, man spread. <laughs> men, man spread. And interestingly enough, I heard on the news recently, and I, I'm trying to remember which Scandinavian country it is, but they have outlawed man spreading on their public transportation. <laughs> oh and my gosh, are you serious? Is because the the men are taking up too much room and the women feel intimidated to perhaps go and sit next to a man who's got his arms along the back of the bench and his legs spread out in a V in front of him, especially if it's someone that's fairly tall, like perhaps six over six foot. So the, I wish I remembered, I don't remember if it was Denmark. Uh, but it was one of those Scandinavian countries that outlawed man spreading. And that's where a man just takes up so much room. And if you remember in my content, I also mentioned that when a man does that, it releases pheromones and testosterone. So as I mentioned that the power poses can raise testosterone and lower cortisol, the weaker poses do the opposite. They raise cortisol and lower testosterone, which makes us feel weak, act weak, and so on and so forth. So whenever you can show up in a bigger way physically, definitely do that. Isn't that interesting? You know, I mean, I, I think you're leading to a whole other webinar we should do, which is just how nonverbal communication, it's not what we say, it's not how we say it, it's the what people infer from our actions and behaviors, right? From what we're not saying, that would be powerful because there are things women can do to be taken, you know, more seriously or, you know, have a bigger mm -hmm. impact in meetings and be heard and understood. And so this was fabulous. I, I'm going to, you know, I, I, I know we still have more questions. I think we need to wrap up, but one person asked, what is pitch? And then I'm going to ask a final question to you, but what can you share a little bit more about what pitch is? I think there's some confusion. What are you talking about, pitch? I just don't understand what you're saying. <laughs> That's pitch. Perfect example. So going too high. <laughs> we, we as women so have I very just, high pitch voices. Yeah. And, and my son used to say to me, why are you going so high when you're telling me off? So that pitch, you can sound shrill and strident, which we tend to do if we're talking to our children. So my son used to go crazy if my voice would go shrill. And he said, I can't even hear you when you talk with that pitch. And I would realize that, you know, my aggravation was coming through in a big way in my tone and my pitch. So you always want, again, think of the good thing about um, Miranda Priestley, where she always used to speak in a very low, authoritative tone, and she never, ever was strident or shrill. <laughs> And do you know that really works? I mean, and I'm just going to share too in the book, my, you know, in my book, when I interviewed men, is they shared that is one definite power move women can do a little more effectively is to speak slower and lower if you want to get your point across. I mean, I, and I'm one who raises my voice. I speak high, I get all excited with, you know, what I'm saying, and I have to really watch my behavior on that as well. It's very hard to do. I'm trying to do it very slowly and lowly right now. It, it, it does. It gets you better attention, I think, but great stuff. But I always want to leave. I, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Catherine. Well, I just think that your pitch and tone is very attractive, though. It's very pleasant to listen to, and again, avoid oh. sounding little girlish and coy that is just not a good leadership trait to show up with at all 
and I, I wish I had that British accent that you have. I, I got to say that would, uh, that would pick me up a little bit. So that's good. You know, I, I'm going to ask my final question to you just, you know, as a wrap up, is there any other like uplifting thing or power suggestion you want to give to our attendees before we wrap up and, you know, leave us on a high note? I mean, this was fabulous. I think good food for thought, but any final thoughts or words? Work on your public speaking skills. And if nerves and anxiety are an issue, make sure that you handle that as part of your speech preparation because I have seen women present with a fabulously designed PowerPoint. They have the, the gravitas in their position, but perhaps they haven't managed their nerves and anxiety as part of their preparation for their talk. So really that's an important factor to consider. If you're a speaker that doesn't have nerves and anxiety, just work on engaging the audience. Again, work on your past, your posture, your gestures, your eye contact. Those are all really, really powerful tools to emulate and to Ooh. adopt. Love it. Anyway, I know we're going to have you back again. We're just starting to unpack you with all the knowledge. And I, I want to say to all of our attendees, thank you for joining us for yet another Women Lead webinar. We're going to be back in two weeks with another part of our Women Lead webinar series on how you can lead, achieve, and succeed in business. Um, all I want to say is have a great week. And thank you. Thank you for joining us. And Catherine, thank you for being our thought leader today. It was